And then I had the pleasure to meet the devil himself, and that was Guitar Slim. Yeah, he'd be playing the guitar and jump up on that table and jump across on the neck instead of playing that guitar. He called him Lemon Leg Eddie. Yeah, he was pretty good. The thing that I used to do. Slim spend the whole week getting yellow shoes, that yellow suit, that yellow shape, yellow shoestrings. That's his uniform for this weekend coming up. Next weekend it's going to be orange. And the next week it's going to be red. And it's going to be something unusual. And it's still hit the stage. It ain't nothing nice. <laughs> I have to say, Guitar Slim was a very humble guy. Very humble. He's a very warm person. I cried when he passed away. What he did, he did it with his feeling. I mean, he sang the little blues he sang in the way he tried to accompany himself. It was all sincere. There was no, you know, uh, pretense. Genuine, I guess is the word I'm looking for. Ladies liked him, all that stuff. And all he needed was that guitar. That was the missing link for him, you know, as soon as he got the guitar in his hand, he knew right away what he was going to do with it. Then he went out and did it. Back in the early 1950s, what we call rock and roll was still in its infancy. Fats Domino and Chuck Berry had just started out. Muddy Waters and Howling Wolf had made their way to Chicago and were inventing the sound of electric blues. In New Orleans, seemingly from out of nowhere came a musician and a showman who was ahead of his time. Few people could take the stage like he could, and almost no one had his sound. His major hit single, The Things I Used to Do, is a rock and roll classic and blues standard of American music. And then, by 1959, he was dead at the age of 32. Much of his history is still obscure, and the people who knew him contradict each other when they reminisce. He's been gone now for over 40 years, but the lucky musicians and fans who saw and knew him cannot forget him or his presence. His name was Eddie Jones, but people remember him as Guitar Slim. In the next hour, you will hear as much of his history as could be found, from his beginnings in the Mississippi Delta, his glory days in New Orleans, to his passing in New York. His was a star that burned brightly and quickly, and you will hear about it in The Things I Used to Do, The Legend of Eddie Guitar Slim Jones, produced by David Cunian. The things that I used to do, Lord, I won't do no more. The things that I used to do, Lord, I won't do no more. Eddie Guitar Slim Jones was born December 10th, 1926 in Greenwood, Mississippi, where Highway 49 and Highway 82 meet in the Mississippi Delta. His mother died when he was five and he never knew his father. He was raised in Hollandale, a town 20 miles south of Greenville, Mississippi on Highway 61 by his grandparents. Two of his childhood friends, J.H. Arms and Julius Ballard, still live in Hollandale, and recalled Eddie and his grandfather while sitting in J.H. Arms' kitchen. Mm -hmm. Daddy used to come to town riding a mule pretty often, and that was over 50 years ago. Sure was. It is quite a character now. If my mother had to die, Lord and my father left his child at home. Oh, he's real nice. He was too nice. Any guy come around could make a, what you might say, a nut out of him or something like that. Kind of picked on him, but he always was doing funny stuff reading they do that. They wouldn't mean to him nothing like that. You know, he just jumped back and do some kind of little hop dance, stuff like that. I ain't never know to be in the trouble no longer. I ain't never know to go to jail. The rest is nothing. 
And another thing he used to do, he used to paint his shoes. He painted his shoes black and white. He used to do all kind of funny stuff like that. He could do nothing about, I guess, anything he wanted to do. <laughs> He's just an amazing fellow, and not to get no education. I doubt he finished any grade. No, uh-uh, no, he didn't get that high. <laughs> uh -uh. <laughs> Even in his youth, Eddie Jones was honing his performing skills. His reputation as a dancer in the juke joint section of Hollandale, known as Blue Front, made him well known in the town. Julius Ballard remembers seeing him in the local bars. He would dance with two women better than the average man can dance with one woman. He was just that acrobatic, and he could jump up, and he could do the split. He just right back on his heel, go all the way back till his head touched the floor. He drank a lot of that beer and stuff. It just wasn't enough women that had to dance with him. <laughs> <laughs> And he always liked to wear them old big sleeve silk shirts. <laughs> Black and white, something like that. And he wear them straw hats. I want to love, 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 love you, babe. As he grew older, Eddie had no trouble attracting the company of the opposite sex. This charisma would follow him later to New Orleans. Then he come to town, he, he married Virginia. They call her baby, baby right. big baby said yeah, bright yeah, baby. Yeah. And she did him in. Oh, she got to be on the high class side. So that looked like help give Eddie a spirit wanted to leave him. Eddie's love of the juke houses led him to start picking up and trying to play music. Julius Ballard remembers him hanging out at the local junk store in Hollandale. When he wasn't working, he would hang out in town on Morgan Street. A guy by the name of Richard Smith owned the, the little bicycle shop and porn shop combined. Called it Richard Bicycle Shop and he sold from a tin pan everything as he could sell <laughs> long. So he had a couple of used guitars and an old used piano and a drum set. And Eddie would hang around there beating on the drum or frailing on the guitar, playing the piano. That's how he started off in music. He wasn't 20 years old, I put it like that. He wasn't 20 years old at this time. At this point, Eddie met up with the guitarist, Willie D. Warren when they were both working in Lake Village, Arkansas, across the river from Greenville. Willie never forgot Eddie nor his having schooled a young man on the guitar. Willie D. passed away several years ago, but his protege and friend in Detroit, Tino Mack, easily recalls what Willie remembered about Guitar Slim. And one day he just started laying it on us that he was the guy who introduced Eddie Jones to the guitar. He started telling us about that Willie had a pretty good job. I think it was down around Lake Village, Arkansas, where he's from, driving a tractor on a big farm, you know, and that this farm employed a lot of people. And one of the people, young workers that came to work at this farm was a young guy named Eddie Jones. And he said that when they were done working, a lot of times on the weekends or whatever, there'd be a party, break out the liquor and get the music going and everybody would start having a good time. He said Eddie Jones was a remarkable dancer. He called him a buck dancer. He said that he just, he danced to the music and had so much charisma that people would just wait for him to start dancing. And I guess he was real acrobatic and almost a contortionist, the way Willie described him. He said he was just an incredible, incredible entertainer. But at that time, he didn't play music. So one thing led to another, and Willie started showing him guitar chords. And said he basically was the first one to put the guitar in his hands and showed him the rudimentary guitar chords that he needed and started showing him songs. And he said he was a quick study, picked it up real quick. 
he would crack a smile from ear to ear when he would think about this kid that he showed how to play the guitar to and then what he went on to do with that talent. Unbelievable. He, he, he took it to the highest level. Eventually, as it did for countless other restless young men, the Mississippi Delta of the late 1940s proved too small for Eddie Jones. Julius Ballard. Back in the 40s, time was tight, there was no money around hardly. And on a Sunday, they could go down to the compress in the fall of the year. And they could wake all day at the conference and get paid off that evening. You went away and found he got his pay that Sunday evening, and he bowled that Sunday night, and that Monday morning, around about 9 o'clock, he left Station Kellum, service station. And a little old bag, one of big and a large bandana that we had a couple of pieces tied up in. And he left walking. From Memphis coming south, coming dead south, New Orleans was the biggest city. Eddie arrived in New Orleans in 1950. At some point, he adopted the nickname Guitar Slim. Several musicians took note of this newcomer, including future Huey Smith and the Clown singer Jerry Hall and leader of the house band at Oscar Bolden's Club Tijuana, Robert Parker. They had a lot of activity in the neighborhood because there was a bar in the corner of our house and there was a lot of the neighborhood people hanging around there, the young guys. And after they closed up all their noise, one Saturday night, and they stopped going crazy. You hear this whining guitar? At six in the morning, I said, I thought they gave the party up last night. So I got up, put on my clothes, and went to the store when it was time to go. And I still hear this guitar and this playing this guitar music. So I paid no attention. The next day, early in the morning, it was the weekend, same thing, you know. So this time, I took and made it my business to go down there and see what was happening by my girlfriend's house. And Slim had the room on the very beginning, and my girlfriend and her mother had the room in the middle. I used to go there all the time. And people were moving in and out that first room, but this time, they got Slim in there. I didn't know who he was, but I know he used to play that guitar, and he didn't care. If he came in at 10 in the morning, at noon, 2 o'clock in the daytime, he would plug that guitar up and he would play and sing to himself. And he'd serenade the whole neighborhood. Robert Parker. And the way I met him was strange. The name of the place where it just come to mind was named Sam's. When you ride in Rampart, they used to make poor boy sandwiches there. So that's where Slim was standing on the corner playing with a little bit of improvised man about like that. The man, Sam, would let him run the car through the window. So I had to go around there that sad evening, man, and I seen all the people standing around. I said, oh, somebody must be fighting or something, you know. And I walked around there, and there he was, man. He had a crowd, man. He was almost out in the middle of the street, man, had so many people. So I went back, I told Mr. Bowling, you know, and I said, hey, they got a guy around there, man. They call him Guitar Slim, man. I, that was his name. He named himself Guitar Slim. I said, that guy drawing a lot of people, man. I said, you probably want to go see him. He draw some people around here, you know. So he went around there and he talked with him. He didn't come right away, but he did finally come around there and talk to Mr. Bowling, and they got together. And he gave him a room in the back of the club. So he had a little hotel there, too, you know. He stayed there until he got started, man. 
Louisiana Weekly, June 30th, 1951. Guitar Slim continues to hold the blue spotlight at the Tijuana Club at 1205 South Saratoga, where he's holding forth nightly with his combo. The crowds constantly pack the place, especially on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights. I'm so glad. I met Guitar Slim at the uh, Tijuana. Band leader and composer of the Carnival Standard, Second Line, Bill Senegal, also knew Guitar Slim when he first came to New Orleans. When Slim first came to town, he came to the Tijuana. It used to be the Golden Leaf Hotel. And right downstairs in, in the building was the Tijuana. Then he started working down in Araby at the Sausage Factory. He used to make weenies. <laughs> See? Yeah, so then he started working, learned to play a little bit. Then he started making um, little gigs. He had that pizzazz. He had a lot of pizzazz, you understand? Lim always did do something that was unusual. Saxophonist Charles Fairley also recalls Slim playing in a trio at the Tijuana. See, they had a trio with Slim, Oscar Moore on drums, and uh, Hewitt Smith on piano. During that time, old Slim's time was kind of bad, you know, but they jumped time with him, you couldn't even tell it, man. You know, not unless you were a musician, you know. But they covered Slim, and man, Hewitt had heavy hand. Them cats had a big sound for them three pieces. and didn't even have a bass player with them back during that time. But they rocked the house every night. Other people who knew Slim recall is telling a different story about where he came from and how he started playing guitar. Trumpeter Frank Mitchell led the house band at Frank Panier's famed Dewdrop Inn in New Orleans and played in the studio band that backed up Guitar Slim in 1953. This is what he recalls Slim telling him. Now there are strange things. There was a guy that Slim was working with in Arkansas. And they was on this job, man, working at a lumber company. This dude just had a guitar, man, just for personal pleasure, you know what I mean? In the evening, when they come in from work like that, man, after supper, they was living in a boarding house. This guy would go sit out on the back steps, man, with his guitar, man, play them old time country blues. You and one day he brought the guitar down on the job. And dinner time come in, he's sitting around picking my head. A gang of white boys got all around him, man, you know, man, listening at him, you know. And he got fooled around there one time, man, and got into a humbug with a white boy out there. And beat the piss out of him. And got away and hid out all day that day. I'm telling you what Slim told me. I ain't telling you what some other cat told me, man. And Slim told me, he said, about 3 o'clock that morning, he got a knock on his door. He said, me open the door like that. See, this guy was standing there with the guitar. Man. I see, he put his guitar. I said, they all know that he played the guitar. If they see him with the guitar on him like that, they're going to know who it is. He said, yes, yeah. said, take my guitar. And hold it. said, when I run up on you again, I get my guitar. That car never did regain the guitar. So when Slim got here, man, he didn't know nobody. And he got lonesome one night and reached upside the wall, man, and got to think, you know, just to, to keep his company, man. Now there are strange things. There are strange things. There are strange things happening all the time. <laughs> Louisiana Weekly, April 28, 1951. Guitar Slim continues to pack them in as the headliner at Club Tijuana, 1205 South Saratoga, where his combo jumps each weekend with Huey Smith Jr. on piano and Little Willie Netters on drums. The place is constantly packed with New Orleans cafe crowds. Guitar Slim, by now, had moved into the Dew Drop Inn, the well-known hotel and night spot on the South Street, New Orleans. He had also signed with New Orleans booking agent, Percy Stovall. 
Stovall started working slim in tandem with a partner. Saxophonist Charles Fairley recalls seeing these two perform in local clubs together. He and Little Eddie. Yeah, Little Eddie, he's a little cat, he'd be about 5'1 or 5'2. He sort of remind you of Gary Coleman a little bit. And uh, Stovall booked him as the 12 year old Wonder Boy. But Slim would put him up on his shoulder. Both of them be playing the guitar, you know, and all they, they table hopping, bar hopping, and all that kind of stuff. Then, then they'd get on separate tables. One be standing on one table, one be standing on the other table, battling with them guitars, man. Yeah, both of them exciting, you know, for us pleasing crowds and whatnot. That's how Slim really, he had an audience before he ever started recording. Songwriter and guitarist Earl King was Guitar Slim's protege and friend when Earl King was first starting to play in New Orleans. The first record he cut, Slim, U.S. Smith on piano, Willie Nettles on drums, and Hugh Dixon on bass. They cut a record for Jim Bullet on Bullet Records. Slim recorded the single, Feeling Sad, for Bullet in 1952. It combined blues and gospel in a way that had never been done before. It attained a modest popularity around the South at the time. See, we all love you, darling, it's a sin. You mean in my heart you broke once, baby, but now you've broken my heart again. Art Roots Specialty Records heard Slim and signed him in 1953. In the next couple of years, Guitar Slim would record over 20 songs for specialty, including his lasting hit, The Things I Used to Do. Earl King remembers how Slim wrote his music while living in the Dew Drop Inn. I used to go up to his room. They didn't have these plastic laundry bags that they have now. They had these brown paper bags. And Slim had these things cut up with thumbtacks hanging on his wall, all around his wall. And he take eyebrow pencil and he write his songs on that. And all his songs were written on them different papers. And he said, Earl, you see these songs up here? If anybody touch these songs, lightning gonna strike them, something like that. He'd tell you some crazy stuff like that. Okay. He said, see these songs I got on the wall? I had a dream, and the devil come to me with a song, and the Lord came to me with a song. He said, you know which one I picked, huh? I looked at him. I picked a song from the devil. He said, because this is going to be a hit song. That was the things I used to do. The things that I used to do. All 
alone, darling That you was hit out with your other man So when I walks in Trumpeter Frank Mitchell was in the studio when Slim recorded his first size for specialty. Slim grabbed me and hugged me, man, told me, said, Frank, I'm so glad you're going to be on the session with me, man. So he went upstairs, man, he smoked three sticks of weed. He did all that by himself. He come downstairs and ordered a half a pint of gin. He asked me if I wanted a little taste. I took a little taste out of it. You know, he drank the rest of it. So we're on the way to the studio, man. He made the driver stop and went in a liquor store, man, and come out with a pint of gin, man. And he drank that before we got to J&M Studio. All of it, man! <laughs> we get to the studio, man, and walk in there. There's a little dude, man, he's, oh, okay, everything's set up and everything. What you fellas drinking anyway? You know? Slim jumped up before anybody, man. So we're drinking gin, man. Man, one got a fifth of gin, man, and he dove off into that. And when it come time to record, man, <laughs> he wasn't there. All day long, man, we didn't get past the first take. The man wanted what Slim had so bad until he made Slim put the guitar down and had two guys to hold him up to the mic. That wouldn't work. All day, boy, look at it. Nothing. So the record man told him, Take him up there and put him in his room, man. Put him to bed, man. And first thing in the morning, man, when he first get up, give him a good stiff drink and don't let him drink no more. Bring him down. It took us all day to get him on there. And the things I used to do took off. Cosmo Matassa was the engineer at J&M Studios in New Orleans where Guitar Slim, among many other stars, recorded their hits. I remember the first time he showed up at the session to record, he had... A uh, canary yellow suit, a fuzzy canary yellow matching felt hat, fuzzy yellow suede shoes. Yellow. <laughs> I mean, he looked like he was getting ready to go on stage. And and he knew, you know, there was only going to be us there. So, yeah, the guys who, who, like I say, they're on all the time. It's not, they're not putting on a show. They're themselves. And so he was himself. But, but he, and, and again, he was a soulful performer. I mean, he... He put everything in, in, into re, re playing. In fact, he wasn't, he wasn't playing. He was serious. <laughs> Best way to put it, he was serious. Earl King. When they did the things I used to do, Slim did about 30 takes on one song. He did so many of them till Ray Charles was playing piano on, on the things I used to do. And Ray Charles was so annoyed with all them takes they did till on the end of the song if you listen close to it you will hear Ray Charles mouth on it when he say yeah they finally got it when Ray Charles say yeah that was it Ray Charles well it could have easily have been I, you know I never did know how to keep my mouth shut when I like something so, so it probably was me saying, you know, because, you know, I get happy sometimes and I forget me recording, you know. <laughs> In the second half of the things I used to do, the legend of Eddie Guitar Slim Jones will follow his quick rise to fame across the country. Musicians such as Earl King, Kid Jordan and Lawrence Cotton will add anecdotes about his personality. We follow him on tour as his reputation grows, even as his health deteriorates up to his untimely passing in 1959. Guitar Slim was a one-of-a-kind performer and musician, so stay tuned and find out why. Louisiana Weekly, December 5th, 1953. Guitar Slim, the undisputed Prince of the Blues, 
has dug up another pair of jukebox hits. They are The Things I Used to Do and I Done Got Over. It was a year ago that the 27-year-old guitarist and blues idol hit pay dirt with feeling sad. He is New Orleans' own. The Things I Used to Do hit the charts and was number one by January of 1954. It remained on the charts for 21 weeks. Owner and producer for Atlantic Records, Jerry Wexler, remembers hearing the things I used to do everywhere. It was an arrow right into my heart because we used to go to New Orleans as often as we could. And when that thing hit, it was blaring out of every window, out of every speaker, out of every record store, out of every juke joint. You couldn't walk through New Orleans without hearing the things that I used to do. As things became more successful, Slim toured all across the country. His dynamic singing, playing, and dancing dazzle crowds from coast to coast. Lawrence Cotton was his pianist during these travels and played behind Guitar Slim many times. Yeah, it was crazy about Slim, man. Slim would have those people like the Pied Piper have those people. He had an act where he had a chord that's like almost 50 yards long. And he had a guy that was his valet, we call him Jimmy from Mississippi. And sometimes Slim would get on Jimmy's back, like you do with the kids around for carnival, reaching for the beads. Slim would get on his back. And that, that seemed to put the people in a frenzy. When we were traveling with the band. Renault Richard is a musician from Thibodeau, Louisiana, south of New Orleans. And he traveled with Guitar Slim extensively. When he would sing the things I used to do, the people wouldn't dance. They'd all come up to the front of the stage just to watch him and listen to him singing, you know. And I think that is an offshoot of emotions, feelings, you know. And they don't want to dance. They just want to look at him sing that, you know. So I thought that was good. Jerry Wexler. His charisma, his soul, his persona elicited religious love and zeal and admiration from his audience as much as anybody. He was like a holy figure, a holy icon to them. His voice carried all of the the suffering, the travail, the oppression, the discrimination, the piney woods isolation, the, the swamp isolation of a black man at the wrong time in the wrong part of the South. At the same time, his music and his delivery expressed hope of redemption. Bad luck is in my family. Lord, it all how fell on me. i tell you what happened. Bill Senegal. One night, we was booked in uh, Vashery, Louisiana. Went out there, a little, little town, I believe it was it was a VFW or something, a little hall. And it looked like a church. And man, it started pouring down rain. I mean, pouring down rain. You can hardly see your hand in front. So we started playing, and the rain didn't stop the people. They still packed in there. Guitar Slim is in town. You understand? That was like the president come to town. Guitar Slim and Vashery. Man, the people come on their horse and wagons and... The guy looked like he come from cutting wood out there in the field, and he got a double blade axe and all this stuff. <laughs> it's country people with their overalls and stuff, you know. And man, Slim got the plan, and the people got the jukin and can on. Slim left the stage. They didn't have a ceiling in the place, but they had those rafters. Slim went up and got on top of the piano and got up in the rafters with that long cord. And went all the way to the front of the building. You could see the people just rocking, jumping, and carrying on. Then he come down behind these people in the front of the building and come down some kind of way and went outside in all that rain and slipped down that pretty white suit. He had a white suit. On. I never will forget it. White shoes. Went out there in that rain and slipped down and fell up under that car. Some guy... <laughs> <laughs> the people had to raise the car up to get him from under the car some kind of way. And then all of a sudden, see, the guitar had stopped when he fell, you know. 
We ain't had no more guitar. We the band still playing, trying to keep these people happy, you know. We still playing. So some kind of way they got him from under that car. And um, he jumped up and we heard the guitar. Oh, he went to blues and jung jung. And here comes Slim back to the rafters the way he went. Back to the stage, muddy like a hog from head to feet. And still playing. <laughs> Teacher Edward Keir Jordan played saxophone with Slim in New Orleans in the late 1950s. Slim was like a creative musician. It's hard to get Slim to do the same thing every time the same way. He would come in singing with the key, and sometimes you had to find the key he was in. But he understood about music. He understood the things that would go over, because I first got an idea of what reverb was. Slim and them had did something with an amplifier. They had sounds going on that was foreign to our ears at that time, like distortion and stuff like that. I mean, that was a part of his whole thing. Like, people thought it was noise, but that was a part of his mode of operation. You know, he heard that reverb and that distortion as a part of music. Louisiana Weekly, February 6, 1954. Guitar Slim, the idol of the South's blues colony, takes off this week to Texas and to California before heading to New York City's famed Apollo Theater for his big national triumph. Booked under the banner of Frank Panier, Slim, New Orleans' sensational recording artist, appears to be headed for the big time. Guitar Slim was also famous for his bright and flashy clothing, both on stage and off. Singer Carol Fran toured with Slim and remembers his attitude toward his wardrobe. Slim used to say all the time, well, 50% of the job is how you look. I might not sound like much, I might not can play like much, but I'm gonna be looking good. And he was, anytime he steps on stage, he is clean and his hair is well groomed. Bill Senegal. Slim spent the whole week getting yellow shoes, a yellow suit, that yellow shirt, Yellow shoestrings, that's his uniform for this weekend coming up. Next weekend it's going to be orange. Next week it's going to be red. It's going to be something unusual. And let them get ready. Now he spent all day, pick up his guitar and work out a few licks. He spent all day getting ready for that gig that night. And when Slim hit the stage, it ain't nothing nice. <laughs> Charles Fairley saw Slim take great care with his appearance before his shows. So we used to be riding along and uh, he always liked to ride on the front seat. We had a big old Chrysler limousine during that time. Slim kept his cosmetics right up on the seat so we get about 10 or 15 miles from the town. Said, Wake up Slim and say, we're getting this uh, Hattiesburg, whatever town, you know. Well, let me get put it. He reached down, get his bottle of water, and rub it in that process, put him a little Vaseline on it. Reach down, get him some Nalzima with a, and then wipe it off with a dry towel and fix his face up there. I think I'm put enough for them women. He had that gift for gal, man. He was kind of free hearted cat too, you know, and he just loved the party. Given his charisma, it is no wonder that Slim enjoyed a great deal of female companionship. Earl King witnessed this firsthand. I don't care what you saw on the TV, or the radio, and stuff. Don Juan, Rudolph Valentina, and that stuff. Slim was a ladies' man. Slim had all the women, all the women, all the women you could even dream of. I want to prove to you, baby, prove to you, baby, baby, I can raise some. When you go to Slim room and knock on the door, you got women laying on the floor like eight, four of them in the bed and stuff. And when you come in there in the room and you're a musician or whatever you are dealing in entertainment with, Slim say, everybody rise. That means get out. Everybody rise. I got people coming in here. And if you come in, the, in, in that room, everybody got to get out of there. And Slim had them all, all the women. I don't know how he did it, till today. Singer Jerry Hall spent a week on the road with guitar Slim and had a specific and important role. 
like that whole seven days, every night I had to guard the door to his dressing room because those ladies would come in a drove and would push you out the way and go in Slim's dressing room. <laughs> and Slim would come off the stage. What y'all all doing in here? Oh, and they'd be cackling and giggling and he'd close the door, nah, 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 and shut the door behind him. And that was as much as you saw. They'd be in there talking loud, having a good time, laughing. Somebody bust out with a big one. <laughs> Ooh, they loved him. Carol Frere. He attracted them all. Had a preacher's wife who was so in love, she didn't know what to do with herself. All kind of women, rich women, poor women. He didn't care if they had money, if they didn't have any. If they looked good to him, he liked them. Earlier years, he liked the little the thin women. Then the later years, he liked the heavy women. Man wants a beat when he go to bed. Well, I done got over it. Slim's first recordings for Specialty sold so well that the company rewarded Guitar Slim with the symbol of success, a new car. However, Slim's driving was as wild as he was. Bill Senegal talks about what happened one night after Slim left the dew drop in. The thing I used to do went over so big. And Dunn got over it, went over so big, the record company bought him a, a brand new Oldsmobile. Well, at that time, when he had that Oldsmobile, they was doing some repair work. But right now, there was a big old, where they had dug it all out, and then they had a big bulldozer way down in the hole down there. And Slim went flying down there through that, went down in that hole. Smack, smack into the bulldozer with the new car. Yeah, he was he was in bad shape for a little while. He's crippled for a little while, but he got over it. He's a strong man. Slim's recovery prevented him from going out to do shows for which he had been booked. However, Slim's managers, Frank Panier and Jose Hill, remembered a young performer who might be able to fill in. A singer guitarist who had distinguished themselves on talent shows around New Orleans, Earl King. Slim runs into a park bulldozer where they was cutting up the road at. It puts him in the hospital, okay? He can't make no gig. They got tons of gig lined up for him. So Frank thought about me on them talent shows. They told me to come out there with Slim Bands. And the place that they were sending me, Slim had never been there before. But after the tour was over, come back to New Orleans, 12 o'clock at night, I'm getting ready to enter the dew drop who I see but somebody with a guitar on their back and a gown, a hospital gown, and a little overnight case with guitar slim. He done ran out the hospital and walked dead into me. Earl, man, I'm gonna kill you. And I said, well, I said, what's the matter? He said, you went out there in my place and if you did anything wrong, I'm gonna kill you. I said, well, your manager told me to go out there and fill in for you. He said, how much they pay? I said, $25. He said, what? Boy, he went through the ceiling. He went in the phone booth in there and he was raising hell. Hell was gone. He said, y'all ain't paying the Earl no money? I know y'all got plenty of money for me because I heard you paying him $25 a night. Despite trying hard, Specialty Records never had another hit with Slim and subsequently let him go. Atlantic Records, home of Ray Charles and the Coasters, signed Slim in 1956. Producers Jerry Wexler and Ahmet Erdogan came to New Orleans to record Slim that year. Wexler recalls Slim's arrival in rehearsal. Well, now there are plenty good room in my house. Now plenty good room in my house. We had arranged to rehearse. I guess it was the day before the session. We were waiting for Guitar Slim. I think he was coming from Las Vegas. And we're waiting and we're waiting. Finally, it seems as though there's a, a human avalanche it comes down the street. Guitar Slim is coming. Guitar Slim is on the way. Fans, I mean, it was like a scene from a medieval fair. Mountebanks, jugglers, acrobats. <laughs> and finally, I don't know if it was one or two red Cadillacs pull up and now comes Guitar Slim with a bevy of beauties and red dresses. He had some musicians with him. 
And he had a cord that must have been 300 yards long, his electrical cord. And he comes up the stairs, and this mass of humanity comes pouring into this rehearsal space. We say, it's slim. This is no good. There are too many people here. She says, all right, first let me put on my singing pants. So he changed into his singing pants. And then he plugs in this chord. And the band strikes up a blues. And he starts walking around the room, addressing different people. And he would go up to somebody. He said, my man, we're rehearsing this evening. You're going to have to leave here. They go up to somebody else, maybe some chick, he said, uh, you look all right, you're all right with me, you can stay right here. And so he semi-cleared the room, and we did the rehearsals. Meantime, one of the chicks in the red dress told us that she had been a dancer in Las Vegas. She had met him the week before, and she says, you gave him a $3,000 advance, right? Well, I got it in three weeks, a thousand a week. He said, he ain't got any more money. <laughs> Guitar Slim had also moved to Thibodeau, Louisiana, about 60 miles south and west of New Orleans. His manager and booking agent, Jose Hill, had several businesses there, and Slim stayed there in between his frequent trips back to New Orleans. New Orleans trumpet player, Porgy Jones, knew Slim and also knew Jose Hill. Jose Hill was like the black man of Thibodeau. Jose Hill was a good man, but he was a staunch businessman. Business, business, business. He had a hotel. He had a restaurant. He had open to him five or six rooming houses. So you always had a place to stay and you always was able to, to handle and accommodate all the musicians. He's a good man. And uh, he treated everybody right. For that time, he paid you well. And Guitar Slim was one of the big acts that he had. Robert Parker also stayed in Thibodeau while working with the Lloyd Lambert Band who backed up Slim. Yeah, well, Sam stayed over there at his hotel when he started to record when he had Lloyd Lammers band and Lloyd Lammers from Thibodeau, so they all were together over there. He was nice, though. Jose Hill's niece, Mercedes Bennett, worked as a bartender in the Sugar Bowl and still lives in Thibodeau. He would sort of go to Jose for everything. He was, well, Jose had a club, and with his club, he had a hotel, and he would live in one of the rooms in Jose would cook. I mean, he had cooks, you know, and Slim would eat whatever he cooked. He was like a family member to him. By the late 1950s, the rough life of a traveling musician and the habits he had acquired began to take their toll on guitar Slim. Now I'd hurt to love someone. Again, trumpeter Porgy Jones. Slim to me. Seemed like he had a good mind, but he like a lot of artists, drinkers, boozers, womenizers, uh, that kind of thing. And that was correct of that time. And just as it's now, like that's what it is, party. He boozed a lot. He boozed a lot. He used to drink, but let me see what he was just drinking. Earl King. Slim he had a habit of drinking uh, gin, and he chased that with black port wine some weird stuff. And we used to ask him why, if he was thinking about the things he used to do, why was he still drinking wine? Eddie Lee Thompson was Guitar Slim's driver and valet in the 1950s. We used to get on him about that. And he used to laugh at us and tell us, well, that's something I wanted to do and that's something I want to do. He said, that make me feel like I'm loose. He loosened me up when I started doing that, when I started drinking. He, he was telling about himself. He had problems and he'd pour them out in his music. Guitar Slim confided in Carol Fran during this time. He was a troubled man deep inside. He had something, I think, running away from his family got, got next to him, you know, at one time or another. And he was a wonderful person, a very, very giving person. And he was one of the musicians that came along in those days, party time. It was it. Music meant a big party. And he parted himself to death, you know drinking and he drank raw whiskey get a bowl and just drink it right out the bowl say ah no chaser when there's no way out you just sat inside 
banking in one hand What it's all about When there's no way out Renaud Richard remembers seeing Guitar Slim about this time at the Sugar Bowl in Thibodeau. And I've seen him a couple of times in Thibodeau later at Hose's Bar. I'd go over and talk, but when I saw him, he had aged so much, he had changed, so, you know, his face, you know, you could tell that, that he was an alcoholic, that he was really taking charge or taking over his body, because he didn't look good. He didn't look good at all. Earl King saw Slim playing on the West Bank of New Orleans around the end of 1958. I saw him over the river there. I asked his manager, I said, you sure he's okay? I said, because Slim, you the clown with me a lot. And he talking some serious talk over there to me tonight. He told me, he said, Earl, all the wrong things I've been thinking, all the liquor I've been drinking, my body is slowly sinking. All that rhymed, I ain't never forgot that. Robert Parker. Yeah, I can remember the last time I saw Slim, uh, it was at the Dew Drop. It was like on a Friday evening or something like that. And I talked with him, spoke with him, everything, you know, and he said he was going on the road. In fact, he was, because after that, the, the wagon came up, you know, the musicians and everything, and, and they left. But the last time I saw him, he was in the Dew Drop drinking, man. He had to get him, a, get him a little hook, you know, as they call it. Well, I saw him a week before he died. Carol Frere. But he had a cold and a temperature. And he had a driver in a valley named Eddie Lee Thompson. Slim died in his arms. Going to the dock in New York, up the steps, and Eddie Lee was carrying him. And he, he said all of a sudden he got so heavy he had to stop and sit on the steps with him. Oh, how I'm suffering in my mind. Well, you keep me worried. Eddie Lee Thompson was there for Slim's final show. And we left the Apollo in New York. We went up to uh, Niagara Falls. From Niagara Falls, we was on our way back. And we, we in Rochester, New York, Slim took sick. We took him from there. He said he was sick on the stage. We took him off the stage. The doctor came and examined him. He had double pneumonia. He didn't want to stay in Rochester. He wanted us to bring him back to New York. We brought him back to New York City. Slim had got so small, we could pick him up. I picked him up. I remember that. Carrying him up the stairs. Whilst I was carrying him up the stairs, he took one breath. I stumbled, and that boy said, hold up, man. Said, hold up, put your hand on the back and help Eddie. And we got on up there, we set him in the chair. And we set him in the chair, he just said, and he was gone. The doctor came out with a needle and stuck him one time, a long needle, I can remember that, and told us, lay him on that table back there. Then that's when they told us that he was dead. Eddie Guitar Slim Jones died in New York City on February 7, 1959. The cause of death was pneumonia exacerbated by alcohol abuse. He was 32 years old. Mercedes Bennett remembers Slim's funeral. Jose called us from uh, New York and told us that Slim had died and he was bringing his body to Thibodeau to bury him. He brought his body. He didn't have any insurance, so my uncle paid for the funeral and uh, put him away nicely, nice steel casket and everything. Got his preacher to bury him and he set up the funeral arrangements. They bought the plot to bury him in and everything. He, he was penniless, didn't have anything. In Thibodeau, Louisiana, in the Moses Cemetery on East 12th Street and St. Charles Street, Around the corner from where Jose Hill's Sugar Bowl once stood is a small gravestone in the shape of a cross next to the sidewalk. This marks the final earthly resting place of one of the most dynamic performers and singers ever, Eddie Guitar Slim Jones. Well, if I had my life he was the blues singer. 
he was is the top. And what I saw in him was that it wasn't he was a singer or artist, but it was a way of life. He felt the blues. He lived the blues. He was the essence of the blues. I mean, that man had passion. No, no, nobody ever had more passion or attack than Slim. I always think of like Guitar Slim, for me personally, was sort of the predecessor to Jimi Hendrix. Because they had the same flash, they had the same great approach to the instrument, and they both picked up the guitar and it sort of became an extension of the person, you know. It wasn't like, oh, there's a guy playing the guitar. It's like, he owns that guitar, you know. That guy is the guitar. Now just to think about what he would be doing today if he was living, with all the technology they got. I mean, that's, that'll blow your mind. When the first distortion or the first reverb I heard was him, I didn't even know what it was. And if they had all of the sounds they got now for him to deal with, he'd probably be in there with just his guitar and singing. You know, and just let stuff float all around and be doing what he does. Sometime he'd sit there and talk to me and tell me about the Bible. And, Boy, let me tell you, I'm going to be here. Ain't, ain't nobody out there going to be there to join. I told God he can't hold me back. <laughs> <laughs>